Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I loved it when my grandmother came to visit. It was all Andy attention. And one of the things that she would make, one of my favorite things, was Grandma Ma's oatmeal cookies. Now, later on, we just found this was just the recipe off the box, but it didn't matter. These were Grandma Ma's oatmeal cookies. And we had this long kitchen, so she would, she'd bake all the cookies, and then she'd let them sit out. And, uh, oh, they smell good. I was very little. This is the first time I ever remember doing something that wasn't quite right. So I went into the kitchen, and hoping Grandma or my mom would be there. No, that's not what I was hoping, but you know, it makes for a good story. They weren't there, but the cookies were, all on those cooling racks. And so, I ate one, and it was good. So, I put another one in my pocket for later, and took another one in my hand. And then I heard my mom's voice. Andy, are you in the kitchen? Uh Uh-oh. So I went to the pantry. Now, our pantry did not have a light in it. So I opened the door, and it was, you know, it was a pantry, but then it had the underneath of the staircase in there. So I got into the pantry and closed the door in the dark, went all the way to the very back, and shoved both those cookies in my mouth. (laughs) And my mom came into the kitchen and said, Andy, I know you're in here. And I must have been making some noise. She said, are you in the pantry? I mumbled through the cookies. And I learned a lot that day. One, it's not, it's not the rule of the Doyle household to just take cookies. You have to ask for cookies. They belong to everybody. Second thing is, if you're going to take the cookies, don't hide in the pantry where your mom can find you. (laughs) Now, I say that, well, first, because it's funny. Second of all, because you and I have become really adept at figuring out how to live our life in a pantry so we don't have to face up to the expectations of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There, I've said it, okay? So now we just let your shoulders go down, and could we talk for a moment? Let's just talk honest. You all, most of you have known me for a while, so I'm just going to shoot straight with you. We cannot get around the fact that this gospel lesson is about how we live in community. You can't dismiss it. It's amazing how we will talk about all the other gospel passages that tell people how they shouldn't do things, but we never talk about this one. We like to forget this particular one, mostly because it has to do with most of us. Jesus is offering a vision of what it's going to be like if you follow him, and kind of the high requirement of following him and what we may have to do, and what we may have to to give up. Moreover, what he's saying is what you have had in your life in the past isn't going to be what I require. I'm actually going to require some different things, and they're going to be harder, not only to fulfill, they're going to be harder than the law that you've been told. Now, um, this invitation for us, praise God, is tempered, okay? So I want you to hear that. 
It's tempered. It's cushioned. Jesus, as light of the world, Redeemer, Savior, reminds us there is a precondition to our following Jesus today here at Trinity. Our attempts to lead a Christ-like life have some good news called preceding grace, a precedent of God's love for us, a proclamation of God's promise that we shall be with God in heaven. This, of course, is the allegory of the mansions and many rooms in John, the meaning of abiding with God and Jesus. It includes the promise of Jesus uh, saying to, to uh, the thief, I will be uh, with you even today in heaven. It's the promise to the disciples and his first followers, I'm going to be with you to the very end, and then when you die, I will be there also in the resurrection. It's the promise of Paul who says that Jesus means what he says, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. It is the great promise of Christianity that we are people blessed by God's love and God's forgiveness and God's mercy. And that is good news, right? We can get an amen for that here at Trinity, right? I mean, come on, that is great. The problem is that we receive this good news and we think it gives us a free card for the rest of our lives, and we really don't have to worry about it till the end. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says you should be worthy of living a life from the gift you've been given. And that's, that's really it. With sweeping brushstrokes, Jesus lays down a few guides for us. And the first one is this. Now, we could go all into depth here, but I'm, I'm going to stay kind of at the 50,000-foot level. Here's the first thing. We are to aspire as human beings living in Christian community and in our families and in our workplaces to not hurt each other, period. We are not to use anger, hostile actions, yelling, acting out in anger. All of that is dangerous, he warns us. He says it does harms to us and it hurts the one who's on the receiving end of it. The high calling of Jesus' invitation is to recognize that anger in all its many and varied forms hurts people and it does real danger. It is true that sins of the Father may not be handed down, but what we're told today is the damage done in hate does get handed down from family to family. It is a kind of long-lasting hurt. And this harm happens in both word and deed. As we harm others, we harm ourselves, and ultimately, we disrespect and mar the vision of God in each other and in creation. The second thing is this. We are making a commitment to God in baptism and confirmation in our wedding vows in all kinds of ways through the liturgies of the church to live a particular life between us, a life that is truthful and caring, and that when things are hard, we are not to flee, but we are to work them out, regardless of the outcome, if it's one we like or don't like. Our oath is not to worldly things, Jesus says, but our word is to one another because God is light from light, love, covenant, and grace. And it turns out from operating like that in the world that we are given the message that we can keep our promises here on Sunday morning and the other seven days and 22 hours, we don't have to be attentive to them. And Jesus is saying, nope, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All of this I have given to you so that you might change the world through your love through your grace, through your forgiveness, through your reconciliation, 
And if you follow me, you will be a light, Jesus says, to the world, and it will burn brightly. And others will not be drawn to you, but they will be drawn to God, God's self. Christian community understands that grace and mercy and redemption comes first. And our prayer and worship and giving and doing good work reshapes our actions in the world. It makes us and enables us to walk closer with God. So spending time with God and those whom God loves is a way of practicing the reshaping of our lives. When we spend time in our other pursuits, we do so at the expense of our relationship with God. And it makes living like Christ harder. We all want a deeper, more healthy relationship with our Lord and Savior. We want to be loving and kind people, but it only comes from practicing it. It doesn't happen magically. I've been doing confirmations for over 14 years. I'll still steal a cookie, and I can't tell that it's made a big difference in anybody's life. But if we stay in community, read scripture, pray together, and worship together, it makes a big difference in people's lives. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say. We are nearing the end of Epiphany. Christ the King comes next Sunday, and we will quickly move to Lent. This is a time for renewal of our church and your renewal. We used to say, family, God came first, then the rest. But if we're honest, that's not how it goes. And slowly, we erode the community and love in community which God has given us. Your priests and deacons are here to help you. (laughs) And your lay folks. They are a kind of doctors of the church, serving to help you realign your life so that you may experience the fullness of God. You go to the doctor and they give you a prescription, right? You can come here and visit with any one of these folks and they'll tell you step by step how to begin to deepen your relationship. And it's not that hard. It's actually rather easy. It's just it requires a certain hierarchy in your life where the Lord Christ is at the top and the family comes second. A real doctor is not going to want to meet you in the emergency room, right? Why would you want your priest to have that kind of visit with you on your deathbed? Wouldn't it be better to start now and to begin to ask the deeper questions about a healthy relationship with with God? I say all this because the light of Christ and our focus upon God's promise and invitation during this season of Epiphany invites us to nothing more than an ethic of incarnationality, to be lights in the world, to live as Jesus lived, to do the work he's given us to do, and that is living out as the body of Christ a livelihood that is worthy of the gifts that we have been given in Jesus Christ on his cross, and in his resurrection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.